So tonight's talk, we're going to talk on headaches, migraines, and fibromyalgia. Uh, well, some of the most common things in headaches, 90% of the population will suffer from headaches at any one point in time in, the, in a given year. Uh, migraines pr usually present as one-sided. Uh, typically when we see people coming to the clinic for tension headaches, it's usually going to be at the base of the skull, wrapping around, or behind the eyes. When those migraine sufferers come in, usually um, you can tell they've had uh, they have those look like glossy looking eyes. Often they might be wearing sunglasses just to block out the sun because that's one of the things that really bothers them. Obviously noises, things like that. Migraines can come with auras or not. So the aura is uh, what they call like the dots, the squiggly lines a lot of times that tells somebody that, oh, yep, it's going to be coming on. They have to find a dark room. They try to take a medication for it. So the, those are the those are the people that can um, sometimes benefit from the medication because they have it. Other ones, they'll just hit them like a train, uh, and they'll just all of a sudden get those headaches. Uh, because 50% of migraine sufferers report significant impairment in their relationships and their lives, right? So uh, one of our patients often said that she would lose three days every month during her cycle time. She couldn't be around people, her headaches were so bad, her migraines would get so bad. She's basically losing 36 days out of every year um, because of that. <clears throat> so definitely affected her um, emotionally uh, more than just that, the pain that it comes from that. Uh, the migraine sufferers have an increased risk of neurological and cardiovascular disease. Um, as we go farther along, we'll discover why that is the case. And 50% of patients have fibromyalgia. So that's why we talk about migraines, headaches, and fibromyalgia, because they're so interlinked with it. And what we'll find out too is that they have some of the similar causes. So when we, when we give these seminars, we really look to give um, root causes, not just symptom relief. A lot of people are coming in on medications and realistically, what are they doing? They're treating symptoms and not getting to the root cause. So when I ask them if they often know what the cause of their migraines are, they don't know the cause of their fibromyalgia or whatever they have. Uh, they really just have their idea of, well, it just kind of happened. They don't really know why. Nobody's ever told me. They just gave me this diagnosis. So then when you become a diagnosis, you really stop looking for those causes. Um, so those people that do come in, uh, we definitely want to give them those, those uh, options of looking at root causes for them. So the medical model, treat the pain, right? So if somebody comes with a headache, what are, what's the number one thing that people will take? Ibuprofen, right? So they'll take an Advil. So our bodies aren't deficient in Advil. Headaches is just a symptom. So we really need to think of these as being a symptom. So there's a, there is a historically documented failure if you have to continue to take ibuprofen over and over again, is the ibuprofen really helping? It's just really masking the pain, right? So, so it's really an incomplete model of how we look at these three things and look at disease in general by not looking at root causes. So treating the pain and ignoring what is really going on on the inside, whether it's um, hormone imbalance, whether it's a nutritional deficiency, it could be an infection, it could be toxicity issues. Uh, that just really fosters your dependence on what? Some kind of medication to get through your life because you have such a um, disruption in your relationships, can't go to work, so then there's more stress and then you get that cycle. So what are some of the mechanisms that occur? So let's, we're going to start with headaches because that's usually the simplest thing. So things that usually come into our clinic for headaches. Posture, right? Somebody comes in with poor posture, sitting at a desk all day, head starts to pull forward, puts a lot of stress on the muscles and the joints and the neck, they start getting headaches. We correct that posture, get them adjusted, they do really well, they continue with their exercises and their headaches go away. Um, the muscle tension. Stress. That's why they call them tension headaches, right? Those are the ones that are based in the skull, come through the eyes. Uh, so those are the those are the big things that are the big three that are normally going to create headache um, that are going to be more coming from the neck and, and going to be helped primarily through uh, massage, cranial sacral work, which we do, and then the adjustment, and then giving postural exercises and stretching 
that typically is going to be your best bet to getting this to go long term. Because um, once again, you're not having a deficiency in ibuprofen or some kind of medication. All right, so that's, that's the headache aspect of it all. Mechanisms for migraines. The old theory was um, blood vessel constriction. And then dilation. This is actually another symptom. So this is what happens after the root cause. So there's that that uh, initial constriction and then that big blood flow rush as your body compensates for it. Blood goes to the head, creates the migraine issues, so the pain. So what happens before then? Uh, what happens before this dilation and constriction? We get mitochondria dysfunction. So mitochondria, power plants in our cells. So if we don't have good energy production, our body starts to suffer. These mitochondria uh, produce oxidants. So people have turn, heard the term antioxidants. They eat their blueberries, their berries. Um, they take their vitamin C, their vitamin E. So those are those are what picks up all the stuff that these are making after they make the energy. So it's the byproducts from that. Without these, as they start to slow down, everything in the body starts to slow down. You don't have enough energy, so you start getting fatigue, which is another pretty good indication, um, another symptom of migraine sufferers, fibromyalgia sufferers. So, so you can see if this isn't functioning very good, it's, it starts to put, put a big um, energy loss on that. So the excess production of free radicals leads to cell damage, so we start to age more. So as people start to really look older than what they are. Somebody comes in, they tell me they're 40 and they look like they're 50 because I know that they're aging from the inside because of all the oxidants. So um, it starts to show up on the skin. Uh, when you have all those oxidants, that leads to inflammation. So inflammation is the root of all evil. It creates all of our diseases, uh, starts to break down our guts, starts to affect our brains, creating headaches, and we'll start to see that there's this cycle that we start to have happen. So with this mitochondrial dysfunction, this inflammation, then we start to turn on cells in our brain. These cells are immune cells in our brain called glial cells. They're the glue that interconnects your brain and they talk to each other. Um, they're sensitive to these free radicals that create the inflammation. And so when they get turned on, uh, they typically are gonna be um, leading to more pain. So you get glial. So then these guys create more of this, and you can see what happens. So we get this revolving door. More mitochondrial dysfunction, which leads to these oxidants, which leads to inflammation, which turns on more glial cells, and we continue the, the cycle. To eventually, then fibromyalgia starts to show up. Um, headaches just don't happen. They just the medication doesn't work anymore, and so we definitely want and more pain starts to keep going. Round and around and around. So with this, that pain actually gets made, you can feel it easier. So they become much more sensitive, and that's the kind of the hallmark of what fibromyalgia starts to be, is that you, especially when we have a patient with fibromyalgia, you try to do any muscle work with them, stretch them, they have pain. They try to exercise, they have pain. Um, so they're just more susceptible to any of the things that you're really trying to do if you don't start to addressing it right here and knocking down the inflammation and then turning off the glial cell. If you don't break the cycle, you'll just continue to have it. So, oh, you just need to exercise more, you need to do this more, you need to eat this or do that. There's where that um, often falls by the wayside and they just can't do that.
So this brain inflammation that we get uh, starts to create, uh, we start to produce something called glutamate. So this is what further excites the cells, those glial cells, so glutamate. Starts to really alter all the cells in the brain and turns them on. Starts to get them really, really excited and then more susceptible to pain, um, sensitivity, those types of things. Glutamate will take tryptophan. Instead of going to so this is what's called the tryptophan seal. So what happens when um, when this if you can't make serotonin, you can't make melatonin, you get anxiety and depression, and you can't sleep. So people with anxiety and depression don't sleep. Typically have more pain issues. So this gets turned on even more, and this is typically cortisol, stress, right? People on chronic stress all the time, and inflammation. That'll continue to drive that glutamate process. Continue to steal this tryptophan. So you actually get altered brain function, brain fog, right? One of the big things, brain fog. Uh, people come in with it leads to what they call metabolic um, fragility. So basically, you're very fragile when you try to change any of their stuff. So like like we talked about the exercise. Hey, we're going to change your diet up. Okay, they start having more issues. Um, any climate stuff. So right now, people because of the big temperature drop, and we'll have another set of people because if it goes to 40 tomorrow, they're going to be like, oh, the, the big change in air pressure and temperature. It just starts to act them all up. Um, hormones are all over the place, stressed, and then they don't sleep. So this is all because of this tryptophan. It should be going down here instead of going up there to feed the beast. So like I said, it causes depression, anxiety, more pain. Um, it actually leads to uh, when we have another thing called This is where our heart disease comes into it. Homocysteine will feed glutamate as well too. So at our clinic, we often run a homocysteine level on patients, have them so we can check that. This can be from a genetic um, predispos predisposition or a variant called MTHFR, where you don't um, methylate very well. So we're gonna talk about that in January, more in depth on that because people are coming in with different genetic variants now. This is about 40% of the population on varying degrees. So you could have a, a genetic variant creating this glutamate issue. So if we don't address that part, there's where you can still continue to um, have issues even though you've cleaned up everything, your diet is clean, um, you're doing all the right things with exercise, and you still have an issue with the migraines. So we start to look at this homocysteine level to bring that down as well too. So what are some of the causes? So that's kind of the that's what, um, that's the physiological aspect of what is the root cause when we start to look at it and break it down. Because understanding that, then you can start to make decisions on, okay, what should I eat? What, um, what nutritional things we should do? Uh, where's my stress level at? How is that playing a role? So causes for migraine. Big one, food, right? Sensitivities. Some of the big ones, gluten, right? Corn, soy, sugar, causes a lot of inflammation. Uh, food additives, so we are really not eating, uh, when we eat fake food is what I call it. Uh, any things like low fat, low, low sugar, anything like that. Well, this has no fat, but it has a lot of um, additives in it. Um, even vegetable oils create a lot of inflammation in our body, which can be um, another food additive. There's food additives in there. So being really mindful that anything that has a lot of colors other than a vegetable, probably should stay away from it, right? So uh, there is food sensitivity testing. 
still debatable on whether it's um, accurate or not because you can send two of the same samples in and you can get two different answers. Okay, so you should get the same answers from the same blood. So an elimination diet is typically going to be it. And I just the easiest elimination diet is eat real food, right? Don't eat fake food. You know, if God made it, eat it. If He didn't, don't touch it. Because then you know you're not going to get um, additives in there. And if you then go it to the next step further, you go to organic food. So then you're getting rid of the, the Roundup, glyphosate, and pesticides out of that as much as you possibly can. And it's being more and more readily available. Uh, even in your typical grocery stores, you're starting to find more organic foods. Uh, we're lucky in our area. There's plenty of places to get eggs that are from farms that just let the chickens run around. There's plenty, um, I often recommend Walker Farms or Ferris Farms up north to get um, to get pro uh, produce to get meat, um, and then produce. Just be picky, right? Be picky on where you get it. Try to shop organically as much as you can. Uh, there is some also belief that we should eat seasonally, especially where we live. So what, what would our ancestors be eating right now more of? So we try to get that into your diet. So, you know, would berries be still available? Probably not, but we'd be eating more. We'd be hunkering down more meat right now. We'd be trying to eat animals as much as we can, store that fat and eat all that. And then when, the, when spring came around, then we'd start eating those foods that would start coming up right away. And then you just follow along with whatever was there. Uh, and that does make sense to me that you would actually eat that way because that's how you would have to eat anyways if we didn't have a grocery store, you know, somebody flying something in from California and all that type of stuff, okay? So food sensitivities, elimination diet is our best bet. One of the often, one of the big things that we see, hypoglycemia. People's blood sugar is going all over the place and it drops, they get headaches. I often see this in kids in migraines. They eat, they eat breakfast, probably, you know, carb heavy sugar or something like that, or they skip it all together and then they don't eat for another um, six hours. Blood sugar drops, they're in school, they're trying to think, they start to get that brain fog, headache starts to happen. Um, they eat something, spikes them up, they feel okay, then it crashes again. Um, so there's, there's where we try to get them to eat something you know, definitely for breakfast, have a snack so that they have something in between, especially if it's more than four hours. And I, and most kids probably can't even last more than four hours. So if they're, if they're not eating every three hours, um, something that's decent, they're going to start getting headaches a lot of times. Because um, it'll be, they'll be fine in the morning and then by noon they got a headache. That's a sure sign that they're tripping, they're, um, they're dropping down in that uh, uh, blood sugar. We talk about structural. So that's head posture or text. Nick. Everybody spending a lot more time looking down. Every inch you look down is nine to ten pounds of pressure on your neck. So that starts to build up on those tissues back there. Uh, we often don't have patients stretch. We don't ever have them stretch because they're already overstretched on that. So we have them stretch more on the front side, get them in better posture, start strengthening certain muscles, limit screen time, talk to them about that, holding their phone differently. Um, if you want to take that battle. So this leads to uh, misalignments or subluxations in the spine, especially in that upper cervical area where it's really going to be putting most of the pressure on it. Um, and then cranial issues. We often forget about the cranium as being a movable segment. So we use craniosacral therapy uh, to address this because without proper cranial functioning, you can't supply the brain and the spinal cord with good fluid. Um, nourishment, that's cerebral spinal fluid, so that's super important. Dehydration. It's often said that if we all just got enough fluid inside of us, most of our health problems will go away. Because if we're fully hydrated, we typically aren't hungry. Because a lot of times we feel hungry and we're actually thirsty. Not until we have that really need for thirst that we know that we're super dehydrated, okay? If you're that far, you need to drink a lot more water, okay? So often when we're hungry, if we drink, we're, we'll get better. 
that will go away. All right, nutritional deficiencies. So, what was called nutrients. Magnesium It's probably the number one, especially when it comes to migraines. Uh, some studies show 80% of migraine sufferers are deficient in magnesium, and you get their magnesium status up, migraines go away. Uh, definitely for any kind of musculoskeletal thing that we do, uh, the think of magnesium as a natural muscle relaxant. The calcium is causing the contraction, it's flooding the muscle to contract it. You need that opposite molecule to come in to relax it, magnesium. So we typically aren't really deficient on calcium. We're usually overabundant on calcium with everything enriched with it. Um, magnesium is usually the number one thing. So if we can get people to get their magnesium status up, that would be best. We really like to run a red blood cell magnesium on patients. That's more accurate. Uh, the range when you do run it is like six to six and a half to be ideal. Most of the time, the range, people will come in at two to two and a half. And so I'm like, okay, you are really deficient. So we need to get that status up. CoQ10. This is super important for those mitochondria, especially of your heart. So often people who are on statin drugs, they get this deficient because um, it blocks the absorption of CoQ10. Um, some of the other, a lot of other medications will block this, but CoQ10 is super important. It's a, considered an energy molecule, but also an antioxidant. So this helps supply the mitochondria with needed things to make your energy. Without this, then once again, we see the mitochondrial dysfunction, the inflammation, brain cell <coughs> um, activation, and there we go. And it goes on and on. B vitamins, especially B12, B6, folate, B2. Okay. These three are the typically the homocysteine issue. If you have that issue, if that's starting to grow up, then we know that you're deficient in these. B12 energy, another energy, when people start having low energy, what do they often start taking is B12 uh, because it looks like anemia a lot of times. Uh, B6 also helps convert your glutamate. So when you do have glutamate, it should go into what's called GABA. It's our calming. It helps makes us feel calm. So if you don't, glutamate then continues to have that inflammation and activate those cells and you don't have enough B6, you'll never make that conversion. There you go. So. We often recommend something um, B6 with this and then taurine to help calm people down. So when you see an energy drink, what is it full of? Caffeine, but what do they have to put in there? They have to put taurine in there, otherwise your heart explodes. So there's where that comes into it. Taurine helps calm you down. So you got somebody with anxiety, give them some B6 and taurine, they usually feel pretty good, get their B vitamin status up and a few other things. So we've grown up in the low fat, no fat diet because it causes heart disease. It's given us more heart disease and diabetes on a record level. So obviously we should be the healthiest people in the world because we have plenty of food that is low fat. Uh, this will cause more inflammation because like fish oil, omega-3s, super important for that. Really important for brain function, DHA. Um, really important for your gut function. So, so those things are super um, why we recommend, to me, everybody should be on a fish oil, no matter what, unless you're eating really good, clean fish um, three to four times a week, which most people in Minnesota are not, unless it's called walleye fingers. So, so those are the nutrients we would look at, deficient-wise. Okay, we talked a little bit about this with the one patient, so hormone imbalance. Estrogen being the big one. Okay. So excess estrogen 
more common in females, obviously, uh, but we do start to see males now with uh, less and less testosterone levels, less and less sperm counts, so something's going on, there's going to be less of us just in general because we're not going to be able to procreate very well and fertility rates are going higher and higher. Uh, we get PMS issues, perimenopause are the most common times for this. function so you definitely need to make sure that your thyroid is fully functioning we've done other seminars on this um, thyroid tells your body basically how fast and or slow to do things how hot and cold you should be that's why people with low thyroid function often ha don't do well in hot or cold they're always the people that have you know 15 blankets on them all the time hairs a lot thinner skins a lot more drier those types of things um, so yeah, looking at that, and of course, energy level is usually in the tank. They can't lose weight no matter what they do. So those those are the big ones that we. And this this will typically cause that as well too. So estrogen, excess estrogen, will decrease your thyroid functioning, um, start to pack on those weight, and then we create inflammation because of that increase in weight. So those are the two big ones for hormone imbalances that we like to work with. Okay. Others, infections. Two biggest ones, H and Lori. This usually is in the stomach. This is what gives you an ulcer. Really likes the left side of the neck, creates headaches, migraines more on the left side. You can get uh, um, trigeminal neuralgia, where they get the pain through there as well too. We'll talk a little bit more on this, SIBO, which is an infection of the gut as well too. So this is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So this is where good bugs or bad bugs crawl from the large intestine and crawl up into the small intestine, usually right about here and then you often get that bloating across the bottom there, but it can actually start to grow up, go all the way up and you can get, a, get that big distended belly after you eat some certain foods. Toxins. So port, we've talked, we've talked an awful lot about toxins. We talked about it last time too. Uh, poor detoxification, the more you can't get rid of stuff, the more it's gonna stick around, the more it's making your body worse. And um, just think of these as like a big oxidant issue, okay? So we do a lot of detoxes on patients to help them, um, their liver's working better. Uh, often you'll see that people are constipated, they can't get rid of that. That also go in with that estrogen issue. This is where also the gallbladder starts to have to get taken out because it's not working very well. Uh, heavy metal toxicity, the water we drink, the stuff we have in our mouth, all those types of things. Um, of course, pesticides, toxins in our foods, the food additives, you can just think of that as a, as a uh, toxin as well too. Genetics. M T H F R C O M T are the two big ones when it comes to migraine sufferers. So we'll go we'll go more in depth uh, in January on this whole genetic issue and what this all means, how it plays a role in your health. Um, is it that important? Is it not? Um, what they're really truly saying and how how will it really kind of revolutionize personalized medicine um, today? So these two big ones, this is that, when you see that homocysteine, this typically, these typically come together, so that homocysteine level. Increase. So, which means you can't make. Which is needed to decrease your heavy metal issues. So. It starts to make a bunch of different detox molecules, one being metallomethionine, pulls aluminum, mercury, all the stuff out of there. So if you can't make that, then homocysteine goes up, which we saw in the glutamate an issue. Glutamate turns on those glial cells, and we get the dysfunction, and we get the roundabout. So, so if you don't address those issues or, or know that you have them, no amount of medication is ever going to touch that. So, cool. all right. 
what are our treatment goals when it comes to migraines? Number one, decrease Right. So we need to decrease these glutamate levels. Without doing that, um, you're still going to get that, that uh, glial cell um, excitation, so you're going to be more sensitive to pain, more sensitive to, to exercise, food, all that type of stuff. So how do we do this? One of the best ways is melatonin. So actually giving somebody melatonin. We use, uh, we use a protocol called the melatonin reset, so they, somebody takes a dropper full of our liquid melatonin um, every waking hour for seven to 10 days. Pulls down cortisol, starts to reduce inflammation in the brain, because really when you think about melatonin, everyone thinks of it as sleep, it's really a detoxifying agent for your brain. That's why it's super important. That's why it comes on at night, so that it can help your brain detoxify. The other things, so if we do melatonin, B6 and that taurine. Because these are going to help make GABA. And everybody seems all calm and happy. So we, all those people reading those political ads and talking on Facebook and people getting angry, they probably could use a little bit of taurine and B6. That would be really helpful. Should have done this seminar a month ago. I know, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, number two, decrease inflammation. So inflammation is good short term, bad long term. So when we're talking headaches, migraines, fibromyalgia, that's typically somebody who's had those on a long term basis. It's because they've had a lot of inflammation growing uh, a lot of times. So we've got to figure out what is really causing the inflammation. So there's where we look at infections, toxins, um, genetic variants, nutrient deficiencies, um, structural abnormalities, those types of things that are causing that stress, you know, psychological, social stress. So the big, the big three stressors, you got trauma, so physical stress, you got chemical stress, so what are you sticking in your body, you know, from medications to food, um, and then the psychological, social stress. So you got to address all three of those if you really want to get to the root cause of where this inflammation is. the two main treatment goals that we want to look at um, for getting people better, okay? So there's different ways we've done that with patients. Um, definitely it always starts with diet, so looking at what you're eating, what can we change slowly with these patients because they are more sensitive, so um, just decreasing something or adding in better options to a lot of different things over time, they do re really, really well. People that want to change everything in a heartbeat, yeah, they're going to spiral out of control and something's going to go bad. All right, let's talk the big one. Okay, talk fibromyalgia. So, what causes fibromyalgia? Nobody knows. Right? It's really just a diagnosis of exclusion. It's what they come to at the very end when they've ruled out everything else. So you've had every test under the book, they can't find anything, um, and so then you get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Characterized by widespread body pain, tender points in the muscle, there used to be um, different points that you, there still is, you can find them where the points are for that, um, and fascia, the muscles, tendons, fascia, specific locations, the nerves and brain, and they usually say it's all in your head, right? So they don't know really what's creating this issue. Um, that's probably the worst thing that I ever hear is that it's all in your head. There's a, there's a cause to everything, so figuring that cause out. Um, women, 20, 
25 to 50 years of age typically is the big ones. They often have fatigue, headaches, right? Um, subjective numbness, so they they have numbness, but it can't be um, it can't be objectively measured. So they go to a neurologist, like oh well, it didn't come up on an EMG test, a nerve conduction test. Um, sleep disturbances, so we see some correlations with that. Gut issues, brain fog, chemical sensitivities, environmental intolerances, so they can't get rid of toxins very well. So those are all certain things these people are just spiraling down the rabbit hole often. Um, it is that diagnosis of, of exclusion of infection. Oh, you don't have an autoimmune disease because you are you know you go see the rheumatoid doctor and your rheumatoid factors, you know, within normal range and your a, &A test is within normal range um, and near the widespread pain that might cause that issue. So, so they usually treat it with what? Um, psychotropic drugs, right? So we'll just make you feel happier that you're in pain is what I often say. Uh, psychotherapy and limited exercise. So these people then can't, they're not going to move. So then they start to get stiff and they come in and they, you know, because everything hurts. So it's really not based on any kind of science. And it actually ignores and contradicts any of the things that they've actually tried to publish on this in any research. And they're really not looking for a cause because there's no money in causes, right? So 10% of affected patients are either partially or totally disabled. So it's a huge population that those people have really gotten down to where they now can't work, they're homebound, they really are relying on other people, and then 50% of those people, like we talked about, suffer migraines. So that, that just tells me there is some link between the two. Okay? So the mechanisms of fibromyalgia. So we talked about it before, right? So the big ones. So it can't produce enough energy. So if you can't produce enough energy for your muscles, stuff starts to build up, especially lactic acid. That's the, most people have heard the lactic acid term when you go to exercise and you're sore, the next day you get that delayed onset muscle soreness and your muscles hurt. The lactic acid built up in there. So that's one of the things that, that, ha that happens. So we talked about the oxidative stress that it, that it um, brings on when you have this with that increased pain perception. And this is what the causes those tissues to be really, really sensitive. Because obviously if you, you have mitochondria on every cell in your body, because they all have to produce energy. So you have those in your muscle tissue. So there's where that starts to build up. And they actually have seen these muscle tissue abnormalities and dysfunction um, under microscope with fibromyalgia patients, okay? So it's one mechanism, two, we get a, we call the HPA axis, otherwise known as stress dysfunction. So our hypothalamus deep in our brain tells our pituitary, which is right behind our eyes, tells our adrenal glands to secrete cortisol when we need to, when we stress, okay? Originally, the stress, this was supposed to be for fight or flight, so when we're being chased by a dinosaur, or a bear, or we're trying to go exercise, that's, those are stresses, okay? When we sit in the car and stew about things, or relationships that we're in, or we eat foods or have an infection, that stress is still the same, okay? We're just not using it for a purpose of moving, okay, or defense. So that starts to happen. With this, you increase that glutamate. So that pain perception goes way up, and then that lactate, so that lactic acid. So that also is where the muscle pain starts to set in. So you get that muscle pain with this, and you get the brain, the brain sensitization, that pain, perce that pain perception. So the reduction in mitochondria, this shows that the disease, when all this starts to happen, you actually get a reduction in mitochondria then, which is never good, so then that's more of a metabolic disease because um, this is a metabolic process is to produce energy. It's not an emotional disorder that most of them think it is. The pain that starts in the muscles in some patients, even if you touch their skin, they're very, very, they're very sensitive to that. Um, travels to the brain and oxidative stress um, 
and inflammation where it's amplified. So there's where you get all that start to start to happen. So if we review that, we get Mitochondria decrease, we get an increase in glutamate, increase in lactate, equals pain, increase, okay. Healthy people can get rid of that lactate, so that's why you're, when you go exercise, eventually it doesn't hurt as bad, the soreness, so these people can't get rid of it because they're continuing to make oxidants because of the mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, anything else that's stressing-wise with this, increasing glutamate, increasing lactate, and then there goes pain. So standard treatments, these are kind of scary because almost all of them lead to suicidal thoughts. So, or help, heart palpitations or some other thing. So. Where's my little sheet? Right. Okay, so some of the big ones that are used, amitriptyline, uh, not really use, it's an off-label use, a lot of things are now being used off-label. There really isn't any efficacy for it, um, it has a high potential for side effects. It causes that CoQ10 deficiency, so you need CoQ10 to help with those mitochondria. So if you take something that actually decreases that CoQ10, there's never way you're never going to be able to help yourself that way. So you're actually going to make yourself worse. It impairs that mitochondrial function, it increases that oxidative stress. Sounds very similar to the same thing that fibromyalgia, um, the same thing that causes fibromyalgia. Lyrica causes dizziness, waking, and always two fun things to have. Try them all. Swollen to the hands and the feet, decreased motor function, so coming um, off balance, difficulty with concentration, so if you already have brain fog and then we add some more, it's really not a good good um, thing to do. And then attention and uh, suicidal thoughts. Cymbalta, that's one of the big ones that most people come in. Increase the risk of suicidal thoughts. Um, yada, 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 there's a few other ones. People use acetaminophen, tramadol, cyclobenzapine, those are muscle relaxers. Um, not no good pain meds. There's very little efficacy for any of that. You know, it's like, hey, we just want to get you out of pain. Doctors are really trying to do the best they can with the tools they have. So, um, Neurot is another big, huge one. Several studies show that it really isn't beneficial for it. Um, yeah, so trouble sleeping, impulsive feelings, irritable, agitation. These people already have all this stuff and I you typically are gonna give them something that'll make them that much worse. So yeah, so we need to look at something different to really start to help these people. So what are some things that could mimic Because we still want to make sure that we that we look at anything that might be causing their pain that would still look like fibromyalgia, but really isn't. Vitamin D deficiency. People come in with a seven on their vitamin D and they hurt all over and their joints ache and they have low energy and they're sick all the time. There you go, vitamin D deficiency. There's a lot of correlations with almost every disease that we know now, that there's some sort of vitamin D deficiency in most people, especially autoimmune. We have to rule out that Hypothyroidism. So we have to be a little bit of a detective, making sure we get the full tests on that, including your antibodies. Is it a conversion factor issue? We've talked about this many, many times. Um, is it that they have so much stress that it's shutting down their thyroid, creating all this issue? We always want to rule out the infection, especially viral is a big one. A lot of viruses that uh, just kind of lay in wait. Lyme disease often gets mimicked as um, fibromyalgia as well. Iron overload. Yes, you can get too much iron, of course. 
So hemochromatosis, simple blood work shows that. And on the opposite, iron deficiency, right? Because a lot of different things when you don't have enough oxygen being around, enough energy, mimics a lot of that. And heavy metals. Making sure we rule out any heavy metal toxicity. It's more common. We often talk about the chicken and the arsenic. Uh, you often, our chicken is the highest rate of arsenic poisoning because they wash the feed that they feed the chicken in arsenic to kill anything that's on it. When they feed the chicken. Um, other things, amalgam fillings, any dental work, uh, obviously lead, um, pipes, um, so I got aluminum, mercury, and fish. I really like sushi, so I make sure I try to detoxify as much as I can. Which fish was better for you or cleaner? So those are the big ones that we want to rule out that really would mimic that stuff. And these are all pretty easy. Blood test, blood test. You can do a blood test on that. You should know on a blood on a pretty simple blood test here. Heavy metals. Usually we're going to do a urine or a, or a hair sample to to see that. So those are the big ones for that. All right, primary cause. This is where it gets interesting. SIBO. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So SIBO leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, which leads to that Increased pain, sensitivity in the brain. Okay. So, SIBO has been seen in pretty much all fibromyalgia patients that they've studied and looked for. So. Severity of fibromyalgia actually correlates well with the severity of SIBO. So we often you'll see a lot of people that have SIBO or um, have fibromyalgia have IBS, right, irritable bowel syndrome, which is just a syndrome. They don't know what's causing it. Um, so you're just like, oh, I have IBS. Eventually then IBS turns into Crohn's disease or celiacs or irritable bowel disease uh, or eventually, you know, God forbid, cancer. So, what happens is this SIBO, <coughs> starts to, the bacteria in your gut start to secrete um, toxins, and the big one being LPS, okay? So the lipopolysaccharide increases pain sensitivity and increases inflammation. It basically creates um, the same things that fibromyalgia is occurring, and you're just starting in the gut and then going widespread. Um, all disease starts in the gut. It's been known way back. We just um, somehow lost it in the years because, you know, that then would not necessitate the need for a lot of medications. Um, so if we fix the gut, typically we fix the disease. So LPS will decrease that mitochondrial function, impair uh, muscle metabolism, and increase lactate production by the bacteria. So these bacteria secrete lactate, which is one of the other things that causes the muscle pain. Um, this is obviously seen in fibromyalgia patients. We also have the gut to brain link. We've talked about this many times. So you have a very large nerve called your vagus nerve. That's the highway between your gut and your brain. So that's how they talk to each other. Um, and that decreases the tone of that vagus nerve. Um, we talked about fibromyalgia here just recently about the IBS. They're correlated, both are caused by SIBO um, often. Uh, results in premature aging of the brain in fibromyalgia patients. Uh, other symptoms that often occur in fibromyalgia patients um, that are linked to SIBO, restless leg syndrome. Uh, can be triggered, this can be triggered by emotional stress. Um, so we talked about that HPA access. SIBO also causes nutrient deficiencies. The ba bad bacteria in your gut will eat your nutrients and poop toxins. The good bacteria eat your food and produce nutrients. So there's the difference. 
the good bacteria are trying to feed you through their through the food that they ate, or the, the bad bacteria are trying to make you sicker so that you continue they can continue to survive um, and do the same thing. Uh, SIBO causes that oxidative stress and hypersensitivity to pain. It also causes a low level of tryptophan because there's certain um, bacteria that will cause an enzyme to take away that tryptophan. And then you, you we saw that low serotonin, so they get depressed, anxiety, uh, and then low sleep issue or poor sleep issues because of the low melatonin production. And then we often use um, what you'll often see is somebody go on an antibiotic or antimicrobial and they actually start to feel better. So sometimes they'll use rifaxone on some of these fibromyalgia patients and actually, or they go in to get sick and like, oh, I haven't felt this way in a while, you know, I, I don't feel as bad. So there's some correlation why. Because if you kill everything that's in there or reduce the infection with an antibiotic, there's where you go. So then you would think, oh, well, why don't I just take an antibiotic all the time? Well, eventually you just continue to pre precipitate bad bacteria over and over again, um, and that will lead to more and more issues down the road. Okay, so what would we do with the fibromyalgia patients now that we know that the main cause is coming from your gut and SIBO? Okay, so treatment steps. One, we test. It's called the breath test. Pretty simple. It's a take home thing. You breathe into, you take a little solution. Um, it's usually a two hour or three hour breath test. You breathe into these tubes um, over that time. And then it, it, what it's looking for is either methane producing gas or hydrogen producing gas. The methane producing gas is our constipation. Our hydrogen producing gas is usually our diarrhea issues. Sometimes you can get a mixture of both. So it, it can help set what really, what antimicrobials we're gonna use on a certain patient. You can also use a organic acid test to see what's coming out um, by products lies through your urine. So that's another good one. Um, we also use a Nutri-Eval test that's a urine test simple that patients can take home, um, send it to the lab, and we get a whole bunch of information. Uh, you want to make sure we do some heavy metal. Testing. And then let's see what's actually coming out of here. Stool. You gotta know what's coming out, what's living inside of you. So the best way is to test what's coming out of you, right? Not sticking a scope up the end and trying to look at things. Because stuff that's in your stool isn't gonna be seen on some scope. Nobody's gonna be able to see it that way. So really analyzing it, breaking it down to what's good, what's bad, what's coming in and out of you. All right, so then we do the testing, and then what do we do to, once we find out, hey, it is SIBO, here's what it is, Here's what we need to take. Um, this is what we need to do. So we start with some antimicrobials, things like berberine, um, oregano oil, MCT oil is actually really good at killing candida, um, or what's called caprylic acid in the MCT oil. Um, garlic, also really good. We use a product called Bacterial Cleanse to kill any of the bacteria as well. So using specific nutrients to really target those areas um, as much as we possibly can, it's usually a mixture of them because you're going to have a mixture of bad bacteria crawling up in there. Uh, fruit, uh, diet, fruits, veggies, right? Real food, nuts, seeds, berries, um, good quality proteins, organic, grass-fed, anti-inflammatory in there, good sources of fat, olive oil, avocado, uh, omega-3s, um, low carbs, refined carbs, right? Because um, veggies are carbs, so you don't want to eat breads, pastas, um, anything that says whole wheat, it's in a bag, it's on a shelf, it's not good. Um, the best way to really know if it's truly a whole wheat um, that they haven't processed it is that it will go bad within like three or four days. It should be produce. It's like produce. So should, you shouldn't have it sitting on your shelf um, in, in, your, uh, in your house 
Okay? It should be eaten right away. No gluten, because gluten is glue. When it sticks to your intestinal tract, creates a lot of inflammation, opens up to leaky gut, uh, and no additives in your food. Um, so if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. So God made it, eat it. If he didn't, leave it alone. So we want to do that. So killing that. So basically we do a 5R program. So we remove anything that's causing the inflammation. So infections, toxins. Uh, Place, repair, so you replace, so a lot of times people have low stomach acid, that's where all this kind of precipitates. One of the number one selling drugs is a, what's called a proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor so things like Nexium, Prilosec, um, Meprazole, those are, those are the, that's the big term for it. Uh, other things that happen, low gallbladder function because we haven't been eating fats, so that makes a big issue with our bile. You can't really, um, bile is like soap, so it's soaping up and cleaning up the area, so it's antimicrobial as well, and it helps um, metabolize estrogen, so there's, there's where the issue comes in with females especially, and gallbladder issues. Um, replace digestive enzymes sometimes as well too. We repair, glutamine is really good. A few other things, but glutamine is probably the number one thing that most people will, will be able to tolerate pretty well. So we repair the gut lining because that's where your immune system is. We start to heal that up and seal it up. Re-inoculate, reintroduce really good bugs there so that they can take over and get the balance back in there and then we want to retain. So we feed those good bugs fiber, right? So we use fiber. We use um, something called human milk oligosaccharides, so something that's like in your breast milk um, for kids. That's why their guts should be good, and that's why you should breastfeed your children. So there's where we start to retain that, um, and then just keep working on that. Feed those good bugs, and they will feed. They will make you happy. Okay, so we start with that. Heal up the gut first. Okay. Next. Detoxify. So once that gut is able to handle any of the toxins that we're going to start to get rid of, because um, 25% of your detoxification process is through your gut, so if you detoxify somebody who's got a bad gut, you're going to make them sick. So, and they're not going to like you, or me. So we seal up that gut, detoxify them, get things moving, they'll start to lose weight, mitochondria will start to function better because those, all those oxidants that are being produced are going to be handled much easier. Yada, 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 and you start to get rid of mitochondrial dysfunction, which reduces inflammation, which decreases the glial cell activation and glutamate issues. You start to push that glutamate into the GABA. People start feeling a lot better. So that's the next thing. We use a simple thing, multivitamin, right? Just to cover some basic stuff. Vitamin D. Three. Fish oil, good fats. We talked about B vitamins. Especially B two, B six, folate. Those are the big ones when it comes to the when it comes to um, fibromyalgia. Remember, B6 helps turn that glutamate into GABA with some taurine's help. B12 and folate help reduce that homocysteine and promote what we call methylation. So those are your genetic issues. Uh, we can use choline. Choline is really good for your brain and for your gallbladder. It makes um, makes your gallbladder the bile slippery so that it's more effective. So it doesn't get stagnant in your gallbladder and gets really sludge-like. We use NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, which is, um, 
helps make something very important called glutathione. Glutathione is your master antioxidant. It gets rid of about a million antioxidants, where vitamin C gets rid of about six molecules, so pretty important. Um, we use something called 5-HTP to help with symptoms, so there's where you help. So when you, when you have somebody who has that tryptophan that's going in the wrong direction, tryptophan gets turned into 5-HTP, which gets made into serotonin. So if you give somebody some 5-HTP, then you can start to make them feel better without having to medicate them and then pull them off it once you start getting rid of that glutamate issue and all that stress and um, inflammation. So there's where that comes into it. Magnesium, we talked about that. There's a really interesting book called The Magnesium Miracle. It goes over all of these things um, and what magnesium is important for, often deficient in, in fibromyalgia. It's often deficient in about 80% of the population. So um, you'd have to eat bushels and bushels of vegetables nowadays to get enough magnesium pulled out of the ground on the vegetables. So, being able to supplement that. Um, vitamin C, also really good as an antioxidant. Vitamin E, it's good for um, those migraines during uh, menstrual cycle. CoQ10, of course, for mitochondrial protection. Melatonin, that melatonin reset, increases mitochondrial function. So it's more of an antioxidant more than anything else. And it reduces that glutamate activation. Um, acetyl L-carnitine, really good for um, cell health and nerve health, D-ribose, helps supply energy to cells, so it's a, it's a good, quick energy, and then creatine is also that same way. So those are, it, it depends, these are all different things that depends on the person when they come in. If we would do this or do this with you, depending on where they're at in their life um, and what they really need at this point in time. But the big ones are always gonna probably, are gonna be, we're gonna do a multivitamin on them, vitamin D3, based on their levels, fish oil, um, some B vitamins for sure. That's going to be a good start for most of them once we've gone through the 5-hour program um, to get them cleared of their gut infection. Uh, and any treatment for fibromyalgia must, it really has to really emphasize that SIBO. If you don't get rid of the SIBO, it doesn't matter what you do else, you're never going to make them better. So if you don't address that, they're still going to continue to have those issues. Um, and you got to support the mitochondria. So CoQ10, Get rid, of, get rid of the gut infection, help, help the mitochondria supply, um, give it the nutrients it needs to help supply that energy. People start feeling better, they'll want to do more, right? They'll want to eat healthier, that type of thing. Uh, reduce the stress, and really anything less, you're just going to be failed to, to be effective. So giving somebody you know, a psychotropic drug to make them feel better, just because of that, is, is just adding fuel to the fire. It's not going to help them. Nobody really ever feels good about it. Be on it. They might, they might at first, and then it just comes down because then the the nutrient deficiencies start to come um, up. So, so yeah. Any questions on any of the fibromyalgia stuff uh, that we talked about tonight? Um, it's just really important, really, to address all these things there with these people, and we do address a lot of it in our clinic. Um, we want to make sure that. Any nutrient deficiencies are covered. Any infections that we see are pretty common. Um, everybody comes in that has symptoms with stuff like this, vitamin D especially, because it's linked to so many different things. Um, low energy, we want to rule out that thyroid. So really ruling out and then coming to this. So if somebody really comes in with this already, maybe they didn't dig in deep enough. So, so you start to really look at how, what are the population of these people really are is it as big as it is and it's just or is it just being missed on that so with that exclusion issue so all right so yeah really the best investment you can ever make is in your health so doing these types of things starting with certain diet um, trying to do the SIBO protocol getting rid of that that bug um, and those infections is going to be super important for people to get better so I just want to thank you for coming in tonight, and if you have any questions, if you want to talk to me, that's great. Um, other than that, that's all I have for tonight. So.